I'm going to name a category, and then let's argue whether they <laughs> actually have network effects, right? Because it's actually more subtle than it looks. So let's lead off with food delivery. Is this a category in which there are strong network effects? Yeah, so I think food delivery definitely has network effects. Um, so food delivery, just to define it, it's the networks where, um, as a user, you can go on and see all of the restaurants near you that offer delivery to your home or office. Um, and so there's a bunch of these different food delivery companies out mm -hmm. there. Uh, a lot of them have overlapping restaurants um, mm -hmm. that you can select from. Um, so I think there's definitely network effects present in the form of like the two-sided marketplace network effects, where as the number of restaurants and different places to choose from grows, the value to you as a user mm -hmm. also grows. Because you'll have the food I want. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a particularly strong network effect because I think as a restaurant, you're incentivized to participate in as many networks as possible. Like it all represents incremental revenue to you as the restaurant. And so you're incentivized to not just use Grubhub, you're also incentivized to use DoorDash, Uber mm -hmm. Eats, E24, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, right. And so all of these networks are sort of duking it out for mind share among the consumer. Right, so hard for a winner take all dynamic to emerge is basically what you're saying. And if you walk into one of these restaurants, the counter now has no space right. for you can get your food from service provider right, with this plaque. So I think, so it's interesting, because I actually think food delivery has undergone a bit of an evolution. And if you looked at V1 of food delivery, it was like seamless. Mm -hmm. And I think it had these, that, those kind of like very weak network effects, right? It was the cost of getting a restaurant to use two iPads was like the cost of an iPad. The cost of getting a user to kind of use two apps was pretty low. And so it had those very weak network effects. I think what you're actually seeing now is that there's kind of a third layer which come in, which is like the delivery person. So it's become a little bit of like more of a three-sided network where it's mm -hmm. like I have the restaurant, I have the delivery person, and I have the consumer now. Mm -hmm. And I think that delivery person, th there is stronger network effects around that three-sided marketplace because that delivery person, it, it's, you know, if they can drive for Uber and deliver for Uber Eats, it's mm -hmm. much easier to prevent that person from multi-tenanting mm -hmm. than the kind of restaurant or consumer side. So mm -hmm. I would say like V1 food delivery was like very weak network effects. Mm -hmm. V2 is kind of like medium strength network mm -hmm. effects. Around the driver acquisition Exactly, costs, exactly. Basically. Around, because they've now, now, that driver piece has now been mm -hmm. separated out and it's now like a three-sided platform as opposed to a two-sided one. All right, category two, ride sharing. Strong network effects, weak? I think they're relatively weak. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, as we talked about before, ride sharing network effects have this unique characteristic, which is that the network effects actually plateau after a certain point, mm -hmm. because after a certain critical mass of drivers, you then actually don't add any more incremental value to the user's mm -hmm. lives um, because your ETAs, once they drop to a certain point, you don't actually need it to be any faster. Um, however, I think the additional dimensions to consider for ride sharing is that it's just such a huge market. It's so high frequency as a behavior. So even though there's relatively weak network effects, obviously what's happened in the space is that there's multiple billion dollar outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, so even though the ride sharing companies have all split markets and there's regional winners in like the US versus China versus Southeast Asia, et cetera. They're all massive companies. Mm -hmm. So I would pro I'd probably come out in the same place that I did on, on food delivery and that I think if you just look at ride share narrowly, I agree very kind of weak network effects that, you know, the, the strength of the network effects curve is going to ask them to over time. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're seeing from the, the ride share companies is that they're now trying to add additional layers mm -hmm. into that network, right? So what started as kind of like a core ride share for people business is now adding in food delivery, is now, they're now adding in kind of like additional services and additional marketplaces over and above kind of core ride sharing. And I think that's giving them stronger and stronger network effects over time. So mm -hmm. if you just take their like core business, I agree at asymptotes, but yeah. if you think about like, you know, now it's, you know, now you've got a, you know, multi-billion dollar food delivery business built on top of the rideshare business, which is actually differentiated inventory for the drivers. Mm -hmm. That's now increasing the strength of their network effects. And you could see a more winner-take-all model um, yeah. coming out of it now. 
Yeah, I think another way to say that the network effects plateau is that there is a phase of the business where there is a strong network effect, which mm -hmm. is getting to the magic number of ETA minutes, right? Whatever it's five or four or three, right? Getting to that point, right, when you go from an hour to five minutes, there is a network effect, right? Mm -hmm. Because the company that has enough drivers in your um, city to get you a ride in five minutes, like that is a network effect. But after that point, right, which is when people have reached that point, um, then you have to differentiate some other way. Yeah. Product line extension or yeah. loyalty programs yeah. or yeah. brand yeah. affinity, yeah. right? Um, and so it's sort of a two-stage rocket yeah. as opposed to like there are no network effects. Yeah. Like it's just the network yeah. effects advantage diminishes at some point. Right. right. And I think you can see that being illustrated by the fact that in competitive markets, so in markets where there's not just one ride sharing company present, but like multiple present, they all have to keep sinking money into incentives for the mm -hmm. driver side in order to basically maintain their market share. So in the competitive markets, all of them have been unable to basically roll back the incentives and just let the network be on its own because of the weak network effects. Yeah. I, I think that, that point about like layering on additional like additional moats um, over and above the network is actually, you know, I think the companies that you've seen re go re grow really big have actually done that. So if you think, you know, Amazon is a two-sided e-commerce marketplace, but they've used their scale to build out this logistics infrastructure, which is now, it's not a network effect, but it's attached to a network effect business and gives them kind of like additional layers of defensibility. And I think Apple has done the same thing. They've got like a massive supply chain and a massive amount of scale building phones. But they've also got the App Store, which is a kind of two-sided, highly defensible marketplace. So you see, you know, they have these network effects, but then they, they don't hesitate to layer on additional pieces into that to really kind of allow them to continue to scale and, and to continue to kind of drive more defensibility. Mm. Interesting. All right, next category. This one seems like a pretty straightforward application of Metcalf's law, which is social networks, which is, look, Instagram is powerful because when I share my pictures, all the people that I want to see them are there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's nuanced and it depends on the type mm. of social network that you're building and the specific use case and value proposition that you're addressing. So mm. I agree for just the broad social networks that are aiming to connect everyone, there's, there's definitely network effects, um, like the one-sided classic network effect as more of your friends use it, you also want to be part of that network. Um, there have been attempts to build smaller, more intimate social networks mm -hmm. for your smaller, closer friend group. And for that particular value proposition, um, those products actually can encounter negative network effects if, and actually become, you know, uh, a, like they can actually uh, decline in utility as the networks grow larger. Yeah. Um, we saw a whole number of these sort of share everything anonymously. Right? Yeah. And then once the trolls arrived, like it was pretty hard to recover. Right. Like right. if people went negative on your anonymous post, right, that was the place where you didn't want to share anything. Yeah. yeah. And I actually think social networks is one of those categories now that's thought of as like this incredibly durable and defensive network effects. But if you look at the early days of social networking, when it was just getting started as a category, that wasn't the case. Um, so for a few years, you had Friendster, Orkut, Bebo, MySpace, MySpace High right. Five, all of those companies were duking it out. And the prevailing opinion back then wasn't that it was a winner-take-all game. It was that there could be potentially multiple winners um, depending on, for instance, geography. Mm -hmm. There could be one major network here, there could be another one in a different geography, um, or based on like your demographic or mm -hmm. interest group like mm -hmm. music or something else. Um, and what ended up happening there is it was surprising, I think, to everyone, which is that, you know, Facebook ultimately ended up taking over in all of those geographies and displacing a lot of the incumbent so social networks that actually had a greater number of users. So that's an interesting example of like just the sheer number of users you have doesn't actually mean that your product is necessarily um, that much more defensible. I think there's so so I, I think I tend to agree that social networks on the social side are probably low defensibility. And I think that's actually because it's easy to recreate the network, like my ability to like add a bunch of friends on Instagram, like they make it pretty simple. Mm. You know, you can import address books, you can do all these kind of hacks to allow people to grow their social network really quickly. I think the place where we've seen 
it difficult to create it is around the kind of like advertiser network. Because yeah. social networks are actually like, like three-sided networks. It's like me and my peers and people that I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. But then you also have kind of like users and advertisers. Mm -hmm. And that network has actually proven much harder to recreate. Um, you know, because advertisers need a certain amount of reach. They need mm -hmm. a certain amount of like certain types of demographics. So mm -hmm. I think they're, you know, when I think of the defensibility and the durability of like social media, that's actually the place where I think it's strongest and mm -hmm. less around that kind of like user experience. Yeah. So they have strong distribution to the people who are paying. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the effects that has made it such that in the past few years, we've really seen the number of entrepreneurs trying to build new social networks right. really decline. Right. Or just um, ad-based businesses in general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. This is sort of less of a market category and something we hear from startups all the time. Data network effects. I'm an AI company. I'm going to have all the people allow me to have access to their data and therefore my predictions will be the best. So I'm going to have data network effects. Yeah. I think data network effects are incredibly strong. I think you know it comes down to all the regular questions of you know can I get this data from can I get this data easily somewhere else um, the extent to which that feedback loop to which those kind of like data networks are proprietary or like within that closed ecosystem then they're more valuable I think the challenge you see with a lot of data network effects is that people are pulling kind of like open data and it's not you know mm -hmm. and it, it they, they don't actually have that flywheel spinning yet but you know, I think if you look at companies that have like successfully leveraged data network effects like they're pretty strong. Mm. So I don't completely agree. I think people talk about net data network effects a lot yeah. and claim to have data network effects and claim that it's a huge source of defensibility. I actually struggle to think of any examples of companies where that's actually the case. Like I think probably the number of companies who have really strong data network effects, like I can probably count them on one hand. Yeah. Like it's like Waze, um, Google, yeah. maybe Yelp. But those are like the strongest companies, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like Google is probably, Google yeah. Search is probably the most defensible company right now. So I agree data network effects are rare, but when you have them, they're incredibly mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's lots of examples of like weak data network effect companies though. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of companies where you think that there's a data network effect, it's actually not core to the product and not yeah. core to the value Agreed. proposition. Yeah. So for instance, um, like Stitch Fix is a company that I love talking about because I'm a consumer. Um, but they claim that they have this algorithm right. that gets better over time at predicting what a woman actually wants, what her right. style is, et cetera. But if you look at their history, like for the first year of the company, it was basically the CEO just styling women herself. And mm -hmm. so with, with this really um, great stylist, you can basically overcome those data network effects mm -hmm. as an N of one mm -hmm. just through your own subjective judgment. And similarly, like for Netflix, um, Netflix also claims to have this like great algorithm yep. that keeps users watching and is able to surface what you're likely to enjoy. Um, but is that the core value that people are coming onto Netflix for? I don't think so. I think it's just the vast library of content that they have, that mm -hmm. the fact that they even have this corpus of content is the reason why users use Netflix, not the recommendations algorithm per se. Right. I mean, there's sort of this uh, debate brewing about how much of Netflix greenlighting a project is an algorithm-based decision as opposed to the taste of a showrunner, mm -hmm. right? And this is a battle, right? Which is uh, the algorithms might say one thing and the taste of a showrunner might say another. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is going to be sort of a live conflict uh, inside yep. companies as they try to get more sophisticated with data, but you want to make room for people like Stitch Fix to say, look, I have good taste and a lot of people are going to admire my taste. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's do one more and this one's a little more abstract, uh, which is cities. Do cities have network effects? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I think cities have very strong network. So, yeah. sorry, I will, I will put one caveat on this one. Yeah. Cities with proper infrastructure mm. have very strong network effects. Um, you know, the, the, you know, one of the reasons I think Silicon Valley has worked and has worked over time is that, you know, engineers come to Silicon Valley mm -hmm. looking for great companies, you know, find great companies in Silicon Valley, start more great companies in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And there's this kind of like flywheel that exists in kind of geographies. Maybe, maybe not cities, maybe like geographies mm -hmm. is like the better way to say it. I think the kind of flip side to that is that 
you can have like network congestion. You know, if you have too many people in the Bay Area mm -hmm. and you don't have enough highways, right. it can take you a really long time to get from you know San Francisco to Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. Therefore, like adding additional person to that network actually makes it worse on the people that are already in that network. So, you know, I think there's a level of infrastructure that's needed. But I think if that exists, then for the most part, cities and geographies have have extremely strong network effects. Mm. Yeah, I had a professor in college who studied this exact topic. He was part of the economics department, Professor Edward Glazer. Mm -hmm. He's written lots of papers and books about cities and how they are basically, um, you know, centers of human creativity mm -hmm. and innovation and entrepreneurship and how they just attract so many people to them because of this effect. And so throughout history, you've seen this where the network effect of a city is so strong that they attract people despite being terrible places to live. Mm -hmm. Like in Victorian England, London was obviously a disgusting, you know, <laughs> dirty, terrible, overcrowded place, and yet people would continually move to these cities because that's where all of the opportunity was, and that just kept reinforcing itself. Mm -hmm. For those of you interested in this topic, uh, Professor Glazer teaches a great uh, MOOC. Uh, it's on edX about oh, the, I didn't know the that. cities. Yeah. Okay.